Good morning. Good morning. You know, I want to tell you a story about when I was a lot younger than what I am now. And when I was a kid, my aunt and uncle lived about four miles from me. And when I got old enough to ride my bike that four miles, I was probably, I don't know, 11, 12, somewhere in there. I used to go down and visit my cousins who were about the same age I was. And down at their place, out, well, out behind their place in the woods, there was a rock. And it was, oh, probably about this, this big, round, and maybe like that tall, sticking out of the ground. And we would go out to see that rock sometimes. Now you think, oh, this, go out to see a rock that big? Well, what was neat about this rock is somebody had gone out there with a hammer and chisel, and they had carved the silhouette of a fox into it. Mm. And they wrote on it, fox with an X, fox cross. And the story goes that there was a guy that used to see a fox go running through there. And he went out there with a hammer and chisel and to commemorate watching this fox running through there, he chiseled this into it. And, you know, that took a lot of work. You know, can you imagine going out in the woods, sitting out in the woods with a hammer and a, and a coal chisel and just carving that into a rock? You think it would take a little while? Just because he had watched foxes out there running through. You know, that, to me, it just, it, it was just a neat rock. I don't know what's ever happened to it because people have bought the land out there and they've built houses and stuff. I don't know what ever happened to the rock. That's a long ways away now. And, but it was just, I remember that, you know, going out there as a kid to see this, to see this rock. We used to, it wasn't too far, maybe like, maybe a quarter of a mile or so, but it was just this neat thing out in the woods. A rock that somebody had commemorated just because foxes had been running through there and he saw it. You know, there's other rock monuments too. I, that, I know that Jay brought a thing up a few, oh, a month or two ago about Cairns, of following Cairns on a mountain up on, I think he was on Mount Monadnock. And Kathy and I have been doing some hiking in the Belknaps and there's some old trails that don't get used very much. And the Cairns there, Somebody has gone through and made cairns, but they're little tiny ones. And they haven't put them very close. So you have to really search for them to find out where to go. And, you know, a lot of times you see a cairn that you, you can see the next one from one to the other. But these ones here, sometimes you have to go around a corner in the trail to find, it, find the cairn. And it's just, you really have to search for those cairns to make sure you're on the right trail. Now, you know, people do things with these rocks for different reasons. One person did it to, to commemorate seeing foxes cross. Mm. Somebody else is doing it to show a way. Some people put the cairns close, like what, what Jay told a few, a few months ago about, about a Monadnock. You can see the cairns. These people put the cairns, the, the trail that we were on, not very close together that you had to search to find the way. But all of these were done for specific reasons, either for remembrance or to lead people in a certain way. And they all took time so they could find, to see these, to build these stone things so people could see them. And for the different reasons. But you know, Jesus tells us in, in the Bible 
that there is stones, that he had the, the writers of the Old Testament talk about stones. And we're going to, you listen in the sermon, it's going to tell about these stones. But he had, us, had to build up stones to remember certain things. And he also gives us stones today in the Bible for us to remember and to lead the way. And we're going to go over that more in the sermon. So you listen to find out what those are, okay? But remember, these stones are for remembering and for leading. And let's, before we go back to our seats, let's fold our hands and close our eyes, and we're going to have a prayer. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you so much for showing us the things that we need to remember. And also, we want to thank you for leading us and giving us your word that, we, that you are leading us to safety and to be with you in heaven. And we just want to thank you and praise you for these wonderful gifts that you have given us. We thank you in your name. Amen. Yeah. There's a verse that we sang about even this morning, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And I want to sing a song to that effect. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am weak, I am tired, Amen. Thank you, Kathy. We would ask now that we would open our Bibles to the book of Joshua. Book of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Book of Joshua, verses four, or chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. And it came to pass when the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, take yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where your priests feet have trod and where they have stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called twelve men, whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord 
before your God in the midst of the Jordan, and each man, each one will take up a stone in his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, <clears throat> that this may be a sign amongst you, that your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean? Then you shall answer <clears throat> them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And if it, when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged. And they laid them down there. May the Lord add his blessing as our friend Dan Batchelder brings us the word. Good morning. You know, I'm going to continue on with the children's story for a moment. I told the kids that I'd be going over some more stuff here. You know, that, that rock that I was telling about had, had a carving in it. You know, if you take and you look at, look at what people put up for memorials, you know, somebody that's gone through a lot of work and time just to commemorate fox crossing in the woods. You know, to me that just just amazed me. I mean, that it was um, just this cool thing out in the woods. You know, and that was before the days that there was, you know, pneumatic hammers and, you know, they didn't haul an air compressor out there and, and chisel it with that way. I mean, this was done with a hammer and a hammer and a chisel, coal chisel. And it was pretty neat. I mean, it was a little crude, a little rough. But somebody had gone through all that time to set up this thing just to commemorate foxes crossing in the woods there. And the other thing about the cairns that I was talking about the, if you take and you go and you get the maps at, at the Guilford Library for the Belknap Range, there's two maps. There's an old map and there's a new map. And on the new map, there's these nice marked trails. But if you take and you look on the old map, there's some other little lines that were some old trails that have been abandoned. And you have to really search for where they start, but somebody has gone through and has remarked some of those, and they aren't marked very well. So you really have to not only find, search for the, where they start, but once you get on those trails, the cans are far apart, and the cans are only little ones maybe two or three stones piled together. And it leads you to some pretty neat places. They aren't the most, um, like I said, the most well-marked trails, but it brings you into some really neat areas and you see some pretty interesting geological formations and stuff. You know, and as I was looking at that and and after hiking some of these trails and finding some neat things, I mean, you hike for four or five, six hours and you never see another person. You know, Jesus said, you know, he was talking about the way to heaven. And he says, you know, that there's a broad trail that everyone goes on. But there's also a small trail that's not always the easiest, but it leads to where we really want to go. And that's heaven. And so he has shown us, he's given us a book of cairns. And sometimes we really have to search. Not because he's hidden them, 
it's because we have to surrender to him to find the way to heaven. If you notice in the bulletin, the title of the study today is Stones. And if we go to Joshua again, the part where Dan just read, that Joshua is leading people over the Jordan. And God does an incredible miracle. He stops the waters. And Israel is able to cross over on dry ground. And near where the priests are standing with the Ark of the Covenant, he tells the men that were chosen from each tribe, the man that was chosen from each tribe, to pick up a stone and to carry it to the other side. And they, take, and they do that. They take it over. And once they get over to the other side, Joshua stacks them up. He makes a cairn. Or some type of monument. You know, there's, there's different names. Cairn is a, is a Scottish name for it. You know, if you, if you go up around the Arctic Circle and you speak Inuit or Inupiat, you're going to call it Inushuk. You know, all different cultures pile up these stones to either to mark a place that's important, a, an incident that's important, or to lead away to some place. If there's stones, people use them for that sort of stuff, monuments, or a way to direct people. So he tells, Joshua says, God told me to have this happen. And he piles them up on the other side of the Jordan, and what, is, what does he tell them to do? When their children ask, what is this? Can you imagine being one of the people that crossed over on the dry ground? Walls of water. And then afterwards, they, you know, when the priests are the last ones out, they get onto what would normally be dry ground, and what happens? The river comes back over again. It's not something you see every day. Israel went through that twice. The Red Sea and the Jordan. And so now you're living over on the other side of the Jordan, and you come down by the river, and your child or grandchild says, what's that pile of stones for? You can tell quite a story. Say, we walked through that river and didn't get wet because God stopped the water upstream and we walked across and those very stones right there were near the priest's feet. And a man from each tribe carried one stone over. And so there's 12 stones there, one for each tribe. And that is to tell us and to remind us what God did for us that day. But not only that day, he did it back in the Red Sea when we were trapped. And we thought we were trapped and the, the, the armies of, of Egypt were going to get us. And God opened up the Red Sea and we walked through. And you know what? We walked 40 years and our sandals didn't wear out. And God fed us every day. It wasn't just one incident that that reminds them of. It reminds them of their whole journey and how God led them. Said that, you know, it would have been hot out there in the wilderness, but he had a cloud over us to protect us. And it was cold at night, and there was a pillar of fire that kept us warm, guided us, showed us the way. That's what those stones are about. It's not just a pile of rocks. 
it is a pile of remembrance. A monument to what God has done for us. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Go to start in verse 9. It says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and and I will let them hear my words, and they will learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, that they may teach their children. Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven, and with darkness, and cloud and thick darkness, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form, you only heard a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on the tablets of what? Stone. Do you think God made that as a memorial for us? Stones. And what does it say about those stones? That God made what with us? A covenant. He made those stones as a covenant rem to remind us of the covenant that he made with us. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach the statues and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. So he gave them another monument. It was a tablet of stones. And what is that to remind us of? His covenant. He made a covenant with us. You know, how many times do we think of the Ten Commandments as a list of don'ts? But that's not what this says. This says that that table of stones was to remind us of his covenant. That it was. It is his covenant with us. But you notice that in the beginning it says that all these things were to what? Remind us and to do what? To teach our children and grandchildren. We aren't to keep these things to ourselves. We're to pass these things on. Another stone of remembrance. His covenant with us. His Ten Commandments. You know, sometimes people go, oh man... These things are just, you know, they, they cause all sorts of problems. You know, we'd, you know, these are a list of don'ts. But when you take and really look at those things that are written there not to do, really gives you an awful lot of freedom. It frees you from all the burdens of sin. Just like he took Israel out of the land of slavery. These, this covenant takes us out of the slavery of sin. Let's turn to 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 7. 
and verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. That's why we needed verse 2 in that song. Okay? So, he took a stone and he, and he set it up there, and he called it Ebenezer. Why did he call it Ebenezer? What does Ebenezer mean? Stone of help. Yeah. It's to remind them of how God had helped them. So, you know, as they were walking down, down through that area, and says, oh, there's Ebenezer. And, and people know, because they understand the language, say, why do you call it Ebenezer? It's because God helped us here. God did some incredible miracles. He delivered us. He helped us. It's a memorial of God's blessings. You know, as we look at these stones, we see that they are to remind us of what God's done for us. Do you have reminder stones in your lives? Of where certain places God delivered us, God helped us through some incredible things. And sometimes we go by someplace and say, oh, that's where God saved me from an accident. That's where God led me in this path of my life. And they remind us. You know, we need to be building up those monuments because they remind us of God's blessings, of how he loves us, how he's shown mercy, how he has led us. He's laid out cairns in our lives. that lead to him. And the only way that we build them up is to be constantly remembering them by building them up and saying, this is what God has done for me. So how do we deal with these things? How do we look at them how do we build things up you know there's been a constant thing that God's been just directing me to lately I get so easily distracted in some things of everything going on around me and you know God keeps saying Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. That's the important thing. You know, and as I look around, part of the things that anger me is just everything going on in the world, how the turmoil and everything. But as Adventists, we shouldn't be surprised at any of this turmoil. Because, you know, we are in the last days. We are. I believe that we are right before Jesus comes. And I'm not going to set any dates. I'm not that stupid. Because God says that none of us know when it's going to happen. But he does say to be aware of what's going on around. And he's given us warnings and sh to show us what will happen just before Jesus comes. And he's laid out these, these cairns, I would call them, that says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. 
And when we look at the things, especially like in Matthew 24, you know, there's wars and rumors of wars. There are, you know, pestilences, there's famines, there's earthquakes, there's everything's going crazy in the world. And he says, that's what's going to happen just before Jesus comes. And it seems like it's getting more and more rapid. Spirit of prophecy tells us that it's going to be very rapid succession of things happening. And if we are in the last days, what are we, what are we doing? We're to spread the good news. We are. Spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you know, there's, there's certain things that we are told to do. And I believe that this church was called for this time. We're a last day church. And we have a message. But I want to look at this whole thing and this whole thing of building up these stones as a thing to remember. And there is a commandment that tells us to remember. Let's go to Exodus 20. Starting with verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So what makes this, the, sixth, the seventh day any different? He hallowed it. What does that mean? He made it holy. Right? He made it holy. And so, this is a day of remembrance. This is a day of remembrance about what God has done. What has He done? He created us. He created everything. And what did He write it on? Stones. And those stones are what? Stones of remembrance. But what else does it tell about it? What we read? It's a covenant with him. That he will be our God and we will be his people. That he wrote this as a covenant. And we have a weekly stone of remembrance of what God has done for us. Could this pillar be a monument of faith for us? Because why, why wouldn't any other day work? We've heard that, oh, it doesn't matter what day. Just take a day off and rest. But God has made a special day that he wants to meet with his people. What would you do if you made an appointment with the doctor and they said to show up at 9 o'clock on, on Thursday? And you go, well, I think I'm going to show up on Sunday. Is the doctor going to be there? Probably not. Yeah, <laughs> that's Wednesdays, I thought. But, but you know, it just... He has set up an appointment with us, a weekly appointment, as a pillar of our faith, that we trust him, that we're going to show up that day because he's going to be there, especially waiting for us 
on that day. Do you think the Sabbath is important? How important is it? It's very. What does it do for us? Yeah. Ah. Let's go to Ezekiel. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. It is the God that sanctifies us. Let's go to verse 12 of, of Exodus 20. Ezekiel. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. What does it mean to sanctify? To make holy. Yeah. Okay. How many people here can make themselves holy? A lot of people think they can. But it's impossible for us to make ourselves holy. So again, this is a sign. The Sabbath is a sign between us and God that God makes us holy. Is that important? How about if we go to verse 20? Let's start with verse 19. It said, I am the I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. Hallow my Sabbath, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. It's a covenant relationship. In the New Testament, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right? Here it says, I'm the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Same thing. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it says, and hallow my Sabbaths. Because it's a sign, it's a covenant. It's one of those stones of remembrance that God has set up for us to see on a weekly basis. It's a sign that God sanctifies us, makes us holy. How important is that? <laughs> yeah. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 12. Like I said, I really believe that we're in the last days, just before Jesus comes. And just before Jesus comes, in verse, verses 1 and 2 of Daniel 12, and at that time Michael, who is Jesus, right? He's going to shall stand up, <clears throat> the great prince who stands watch over sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is fit, found written in the, in the book. What book is that? The Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to, ever, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, so <clears throat> Jesus is going to stand up just before he comes. 
But you know, he makes a proclamation at that time. When Jesus stands up. And we find that in Revelation. If we go to Revelation... Chapter 22, in verse 11. And that proclamation is, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. So now do you think being holy, being sanctified by God is important? Because in Daniel we read that some are going to be taken into everlasting life and others are going to be into everlasting shame, right? So the ones that are in shame are the ones that are filthy and unjust. And those that are going to be taken into everlasting life are the ones that are righteous and holy. And Ezekiel says that the Sabbath is the sign between God and man that God makes man holy. So what does that have to do with us now? In the last days of the church that's called to proclaim a message. Let's turn to Revelation 14. Just keep your finger, oh, I'll just quote it here. Said before that we need to preach the gospel, the good news. The gospel, it says in um, Matthew twenty four fourteen. it says, when the gospel is preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, the end will come. All time prophecy has been fulfilled now. October, October 22nd, 1844, everything was time. All the time prophecies have been fulfilled. So why isn't Jesus here yet? It hasn't been preached, right? It hasn't been preached to the whole world. Now, I don't know about you, I can't go to the whole world. I've got a corner of the world that God's put me in. Each of us have a corner, and we can preach to that, wor that corner of the world. So... In Revelation 14, starting with verse 6, it says, And I saw an other angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting, Everlasting gospel. Right? So, Matthew 24, 14, it says, When the gospel is preached, this is the everlasting gospel, it's the same one. That the gospel will be preached. To every nation tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, no, let me read that right, saying in a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven, earth, seas, and springs of water. Notice it's with a loud voice.
How many times are we timid about the Sabbath? Because this is talking about the Sabbath right here. Because it's quoting this, the, the Sabbath commandment. Because God made those things. And it's all about worship. What's the Sabbath about? Worship. A relationship with God. You know, not about the rest of you guys, but sometimes I get pretty timid about that. And I've used this ver these verses here before. And you'll probably hear them again because they're some of my favorite verses, but I haven't got it all down yet. Maybe you guys do. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul writing here, it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Christ. The everlasting gospel. You know? For it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jews first and also for the Greeks. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, I believe all that, but sometimes I'm timid and I'm not wanting to speak loudly about it. I want to be like Paul. This is, I'm not ashamed of it. I'll speak it loudly. And how important is this? If you looked out in the road right now and there was a little kid playing in the road and you see a tractor trailer coming down the road, you're going to go, um, um, hey, um, kid. By the time you got it out, the kid would be squashed. you go, hey, get out of the road or you'd run out there and grab the kid. Or both. The proclamation of the three angels' message is to be done that way, not the, oh, um, um, you might not like to hear this, but, um, does it matter? It's told to be done with a loud voice. And to be like Paul, not to be ashamed of the gospel. And another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. anyone receives the beast and his image. What's the image of the beast? False it's false worship. It's a false Sabbath. You know, and we're afraid to offend people by saying it. We can do it in love, but we can also do it very strongly in love. Because it's just like that little kid out in the road. If they continue to follow that, they're going to get squashed. God has called us as a people to proclaim this message of the everlasting gospel. About the covenant that God has with us. The sign of righteousness. The sign that sanctifies us. It's the last test before Jesus comes. Do we keep it to ourselves? 
and just be smug. Well, we're going to make it and they aren't because look what they're doing. Their blood will be on our shoulders, on our head. This church was called to proclaim this message to the world. That Jesus is coming soon. And there's a lot of lost people that need to hear the message. Continuing on in, in Revelation 14. It says, In the smoke of the torment, their torment ascends forever and ever. Until it's done. It's done. I mean, this whole thing about burning forever, it just means until they're burnt up. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. But here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments, all ten of them, right? Not just a few, not one, but keep the commandments of God. And have what? The faith of Jesus. Remember what the gospel, the definition of the gospel says? Let's go back to to Romans 1. And it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the, what? The righteousness of God is revealed. Is revealed from what? Faith to faith. What faith are we talking about? The faith of Jesus. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those that Jesus has made legal, the just, made legal to enter into heaven, will live by faith. It's the faith in Jesus, or the faith of Jesus. And it says, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They live the gospel. The gospel. When we live it, we're going to preach it. With a loud voice. And you know what? When that goes out, what's going to happen? The end will come. What is the end come? Jesus is going to come. Isn't that what we're looking for? You know, like I said, the Lord just keeps bringing this on my heart. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Don't worry about all the other stuff going around on around you. Don't get all tied up in those controversies. Preach the gospel. When we put that first and foremost, do you think Jesus is going to be right with us all the way? You know, my prayer for each of us is that we take these stones that God has given us, these monuments, that he is our Ebenezer, he is our stone of help, that he has laid out these cairns that lead on that, that straight and narrow path, the monuments of all the wonderful things that God has done for us, the miracles that he's brought us through. And he says, preach the gospel because I've written my covenant on a stone for you. And I'm asking you to go out and show my covenant with those that are lost. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Preach it with a loud voice. I've shared this quote before here. 
And I want to read it again because I think it goes so wonderfully with this, with this study. It's from Council to Parents, Teachers, and Students on page 324. It says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of the Savior shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord, where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown and the, with the seed of the gospel. The last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come. What a promise. And also what a challenge. My prayer is that each of us will ask God to help us to live out the gospel, to preach the gospel, and look at those stones that he has built for us so we can always remember how he has blessed us, how he has guided us, and how he is continuing to guide us. Let's preach the gospel, and let's look forward to the coming of Christ. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. Glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.